October 29th. Only prayer, silence, and love are effective. It is better to turn the heart of other people through secret prayer than to their ears. St. Porfirios of Cavsocolivia. Commemorations. The Virgin Martyr Anastasia the Roman in the year 256. The Venerable Abramius the Recluse in the year 360. And his niece, St. Mary of Mesopotamia in the year 397. Venerable Abramius, Archimandrite of Rostov, Valam, in the year 1073. New Hiram Martyrs Nicholas, priest, and with him Cosma, Victor, Naum, Philip, John, Paul, Andrew, Paul, Basil, Alexis, John, and Virgin Martyr Agafia in the year 1918. New Hiram Martyr John, priest, in the year 1930. New Hiram Martyr Eugene, priest, in the year 1937. Virgin Martyr Anastasia, 1937. New Hiram Martyr Leonid, priest, 1941. Martyrs Claudius, Asterius, Neon, and Theonilla of Agay in Cilicia in the year 285. Venerable Anna, known as Euphemianus of Constantinople in the year 826. Venerable Abramius, recluse of the Kiev Caves, 12th and 13th century. Venerable Martyr Anastasius, Venerable Ermelindis Hermitus in the 6th century in the Netherlands, New Martyr Athanasius of Sparta, Muatanak, 1653, Greece, Martyr Timothy of Esphigmino Monastery, Mount Athos in the year 1820. Martyr Melantine of Marcionopolis. Martyr Cyril, Menas, and Manus. Saint Rostislav, Prince of Moravia, Czechoslovakia, in the year 870. And finally, on October 29th, we commemorate Saint Serapion of Zarzma in Georgia, in the year 900. Saint Serapion of Zarzma in the year 900. Saint Serapion of Zarzma was the son of a clergetti aristocrat famed for his wealth and good deeds. Serapion had two brothers who were still young when their mother died. Their father also reposed soon after. From childhood, Saint Serapion longed to lead the life of a hermit. With his younger brother, John, he set off for Pareki Monastery, where he requested the spiritual guidance of the spiritual father and teacher of orphans, the great wonder worker, Michael of Pareki. The older brother remained at home to continue the family tradition of caring for wanderers and the poor. Saint Michael perceived in the young Serapion true zeal for a divine ministry and blessed him to enter the priesthood. Once, while he was praying, St. Michael was instructed in a vision to send his disciples Serapion and John to Samtsky to found a monastery. Serapion was alarmed at the thought of such a great responsibility, but he submitted to his spiritual father's will and set off for Samtsky with several companions. He took with him a wonder-working icon of our Lord's transfiguration. 
the monks climbed to the peak of a very high mountain and, having looked around at their environs, decided to settle there and begin construction of the monastery. But soon the villagers chased the monks away, and the Holy Fathers located the exact place that their shepherd, St. Michael, had seen in the vision. At that time, a faithful nobleman named George Chorcianelli ruled in this mountainous region. Once while he was out hunting, George saw smoke over the dense forest and sent a servant to discover the cause. He was soon informed that two remarkable monks had settled in that place. Immediately, he set off for the spot, humbly greeted the monks, venerated the wonder-working icon, and asked for the Father's blessings. Overjoyed and inspired by Serapion's preaching, the prince fell on his knees before him and promised to help him in every way to establish the new monastery. Having donated this land and the surrounding area to the monastery, he presented the monks with a deed assigning ownership of all the territory the monks could cover on foot in one day to the future monastery. The prince sent his servant to accompany them. The brothers walked over unexplored territory through dense forests and over rocky paths. Two local residents, the God-fearing Ia and Garbanelli, accompanied them, but not all the local people received the monks so warmly. The residents of Tsikvili met them with hostility and tried to block their path. That very same night, a miracle occurred an earthquake split the rocks that were holding back Lake Satavaki and washed away the entire village of Tiskvili. Only two brothers survived. To this day, this place has been called Zarzma. The word Zari is often used to denote a tragic occurrence. The brethren began to search for a suitable place to build their church. St. Serapion wanted to construct the church on a high hill, but John and the other brothers objected. It is not necessary, Holy Father, to build in this place, they said. It is high and cold here, and the brothers are dressed only in rags. To resolve this question, the Holy Fathers filled two small icon lamps with equal amounts of oil. Serapion placed one of them at the top of the hill. John placed the other near a stream on the southern side of the hill and they began to pray. At daybreak, Serapion's lamp had already gone out, but John's lamp continued to burn until midday. Thus they began to build the church in the place that John had chosen. The monks faced many obstacles in the construction of their church. The area was covered with dense forest, and the stones necessary for the building could only be found in the river. At George Chorcinelli's suggestion, they salvaged the stone from a church that had been destroyed by the earthquake. After three years of construction, the monastery was completed, and the wonder-working icon of the Transfiguration was placed in the altar of the church. The monks fashioned cells, and St. Serapion established the rules of the monastery. When he was approaching death, Michael of Parecki sent two of his disciples to Serapion and John. When he learned that the construction of the monastery was completed, he rejoiced exceedingly and blessed its benefactor, George Chorcinelli. Then he took the withered branch of a box tree and presented it to him, saying, My son, plant this tree near the church, and if it blossoms again, know that it is God's will that you zealously continue the work you have begun in his name. After some time, the branch blossomed, and his miracle became known to many. When the blessed Serapion sensed the approach of death, he summoned the brothers, bade them farewell, and appointed Hieromonk George, his successor as abbot. He was buried with great honor on the eastern side of the altar at the monastery church. St. Ermelintis, Anchoris, and Meldaert. 
Ermelindis was from a very illustrious family in modern-day Belgium in the late 6th century. She was given an upbringing befitting her birth, but she thirsted for nothing but seclusion, prayer, and the word of God from a young age. To prevent any marriage proposals, she made a vow of virginity and cut off her hair. She left her parents and hid in the little town of Bevec, where she would go to church barefoot and pass her days and nights in prayer. An angel warned Ermelindis that two young squires were setting traps for her virtue, so she moved to Meldaert. She passed the rest of her days eating only wild herbs and living the austere life like the desert ascetics of old, overcoming the flesh and the devil in many combats. When she died in the 7th century, it is said that angels buried her and chanted hymns for her funeral. 48 years later, the miracles her relics worked were made known and she was moved to a convent. Icons of St. Emerlindis portray her surrounded by angels presiding over her funeral. Her relics have been moved several times and even hidden during conflicts. Now they are enclosed in a magnificent reliquary of gilded bronze. The holy martyrs Claudius, Asterius, Neonis, and Theonila. The holy martyrs Claudius, Asterius, Neonis, and Theonilla suffered for Christ in the year 285 in Cilicia during the reign of Emperor Diocletian. After their father's death, the stepmother, not wanting to give the inheritance over to the children, betrayed them to the persecutors of Christians. The governor of Cilicia, named Lysias, at length urged the martyrs to renounce Christ and instead worship idols, and employing various means of torture. They crucified the unyielding brothers, and the sister after torture was thrown into the sea. Saints Cyril, Menes, and Menaus, the martyrs, they were martyred by swords. Saint Savas, the soldier, he was martyred after they killed him by piercing his ribs with a spear. Saint Melitini the martyr. Saint Melitini was accused as a Christian and led to the local Lord where she confessed her faith in Christ. The Lord there was enraged and ordered her to be brutally beaten in the face. Afterwards, they stripped her and took her to the court where she was interrogated for several hours. After the interrogation, she was subjected to many more tortures. She was finally subjected to the punishment of beheading. Thus, the holy martyr Melitini finished and received from the Lord the indestructible crown of martyrdom. Saint Agiavasa, her memory is mentioned in sermons Synaxarist, and as is as follows. On this day, memory of the holy apostles and martyrs Peter, Paul, John the Forerunner and Baptist, Stephen the first martyr, Barnabas the Apostle, Joseph the Patriarch, and Cleopas, Trophimus, Dorimedon, Cosmus, Damianus, Fasis, and their retinue, and their meeting is held in the sept of the apostolate of the holy and glorious Apostle Paul in the orphanage, as well as the inauguration of this temple. The Venerable Anna, known as Euphemianus of Constantinople in the year 826. The nun Anna and her son, St. John, lived in Byzantium, and St. Anna was the daughter of a deacon of the Blackerne Church in Constantinople. After the death of her husband, dressed in men's clothing and using the name Euthymian, together with her son, St. John, she began to pursue asceticism in one of the Bithynian monasteries near Olympus. 
the nun Anna died in Constantinople in the year 826. Her memory is celebrated a second time on the 13th of June. The Venerable Virgin Martyr Anastasia the Roman in the year 250. She was born in Rome of noble parents and was left an orphan at the age of three. As an orphan, she was taken to a convent near Rome where the abbess was Sophia, a nun of the highest level of perfection. After 17 years, Anastasia was well known among the Christians as a great ascetic and among the pagans as a rare beauty. Probus, the pagan governor, heard of Anastasia and sent his soldiers to bring her to him. For two hours, the good abbess Sophia counseled Anastasia how to keep the faith, how to resist flattering deceits, and how to endure torture. Anastasia said to her, My heart is ready to suffer for Christ. My soul is ready to die for my sweet Jesus. Brought before the governor, Anastasia openly expressed her faith in Christ the Lord. And when the governor tried to turn her away from the faith, first by promises and then by threats, the martyr said to him, I am ready to die for my Lord, not only once, but, oh, if it were only possible, a hundred times. When they stripped her naked to humiliate her, she cried out to the servants, Whip me, cut me up, and tear me apart. Cover my naked body with wounds, and cover my shame with blood. She was beaten torn and cut up. On two occasions, she felt a great thirst and asked for water, and a Christian, Cyril, gave her a drink, for which he was blessed by the martyr of Christ and beheaded by the pagans. Anastasia's breasts and tongue were severed, but an angel of God appeared and sustained her. Finally, she was beheaded outside the city. Blessed Sophia found her body and buried it honorably. Anastasia was crowned with the wreath of martyrdom during the reign of Decius. More on the monastic martyress Anastasia the Roman. The monastic martyress Anastasia the Roman in infancy lost her parents, and she was then taken under the care of the head of a woman's monastery named Sophia. The hegemonists raised Anastasia in fervent faith, in the fear of God and obedience. During these times, there began the persecution against Christians by the Emperor Decius in the years 249 to 251. The city administrator, Probus, on the orders of the Emperor, commanded that Anastasia be brought to him, having been blessed by her eldress mentor for the deed of suffering in the name of Christ. The young martyress Anastasia humbly came out to meet the armed soldiers. Seeing her youth and beauty, Probus at first attempted by false flattery to tempt her and lead her into a renunciation of faith in Christ. Why waste thine years, deprived of pleasure? What is there to gain in giving thyself over to the tortures and death for the crucified? Worship our gods, get thyself some handsome husband, and live in glory and honor. The saint steadfastly replied, My bridegroom, my riches, my life, and my happiness is my Lord, Jesus Christ. And with the threat of torments thou canst not part me from the Lord. Fearsome tortures were then begun. The holy martyrs bravely endured them, glorifying and praising the Lord. In anger, the torturers cut out her tongue, the people, seeing the inhumane and disgusting treatment of the saint, became indignant, and the governor of the city was compelled to bring the torture to a close by beheading the martyrs. The body of Saint Anastasia was thrown out beyond the city for devouring by wild animals, but the Lord did not permit that a mockery should be made with the holy remains. Learning of this through the Lord, the abbess Sophia found the torn body of the martyrs, and with the help of two Christians, she consigned it to earth. And 
from the Synaxarion about the Saint Anastasia of Rome, the Holy Martyr. Holy Anastasia lived in the years of Diocletian and came from Rome. When her rich parents died, she distributed the property she inherited to the poor and retired to a monastery. When the ruler Probus arrested her, she reminded Anastasia of her blooming youth, for which she would have to deny Christ. Then Anastasia's answer was powerful. I, she said, know of beauty and youth that which Christ gives to faithful and brave souls who prefer death for him to other worldly goods when they are proposed for the betrayal of oh my God. I had plenty of wealth, I didn't want it. But I want my Christ, and no power will be able to separate me from him. When in doubt, try it. Enraged by the answer, Probus whipped her in the face and spread her on hot coals. Then he hanged her and tore her body apart. Then he cut off her breasts, pulled out her nails, and finally beheaded her. Thus Anastasia received the amaranth crown of martyrdom. of Kassana in Thrace. He was married and had two daughters. His wife was seized by the Turks and forced to become a Muslim. In order to save his wife from the harem, he pretended to become a Muslim. After rescuing his wife, he conducted her to a convent while he went to the great Lavra on Mount Athos and then to the monastery of Esphigmenu. He desired martyrdom for Christ, like Agen Agathenaeus of his figment. He was beheaded in Jedri on October 29, 1820. His body was thrown into a river, but his clothing was retrieved by Elder Germanus, the spiritual father of his figment. Archimandrite of Rostov, in the world of Verki, in his youth left from his parental home and entered upon the path of Christian asceticism. Having assumed the monastic form, Avrami settled at Rostov on the shore of Lake Nero. In the Rostov lands, there were then yet many pagans, and the monk worked intensely at spreading the true faith. Not far off from the cell of the saint, there was a pagan temple where the pagans worshipped a stone idol of Velis or Volos, which caused fright among the inhabitants of Rostov. In a miraculous vision, the apostle John the theologian came to stand before Avrami and gave him a staff crowned with a cross atop with which the monk destroyed the idol. At the place of the pagan temple, Saint Avrami founded a monastery in honor of the Theophany and became its head. And in memory of the miraculous appearance, the monk erected a church in the name of the Apostle John the Theologian. Many of the pagans were persuaded and baptized by Saint Avrami. Particularly great was his influence with the children. He taught them reading and writing. He instructed them in the law of God and tonsured monastics from amongst them. Everyone coming to the monastery of the saint was lovingly accepted. His life was a constant work of prayer and toil for the benefit of the brethren. He chopped firewood for the oven. He laundered and laundered the monks' clothing for them and carried water to the kitchen. The monk reposed in old age and was buried in the church of the Theophany. His holy relics were uncovered during the time of great prince Ves Sovelot in the years 1176 to 1212. In the year 1551, Tsar Ivan the Terrible, before his campaign against Kazan, made the rounds of the holy places. At the Theophany, 
Avramiev Monastery showed him the st- that showed him the st- that staff with which the monk Avrami had destroyed the idol of Veles. The Tsar took the staff with him on the campaign, but the cross remained at the monastery. And returning again after the subjugation of the Kazan Khanite, Ivan the Terrible gave orders to build the Avramiev Monastery, a new stone church in honor of the Theophany with four chapels. And he sent there books and icons. Abramius, a recluse, and his niece, Mary, of Mesopotamia. Forced to do so by his parents, he married, but on the very day of his wedding, he left his bride, his parents' home, and all that he possessed, and withdrew into solitude to live a life of strict asceticism. He labored thus for fifty years and left his cell only twice during that time. The first time, he left at the order of his bishop to convert a pagan village to the Christian faith. The second time he came out to save his licentious niece Mary in the year 397. He entered into rest peacefully in the year 360 at the age of 70. from the calendar and the Synaxarion, the monk Abramius, or Abraham the Hermit, and Blessed Maria, or Mary, his niece. The monk Abraham the Hermit and Blessed Maria, his niece, asceticized in the village of Chidon near the city of Edessa. They were contemporaries and of the same country together with the monk Ephraim of Syria commemorated on the 28th of January, who afterwards wrote about their life. The monk Abraham began his difficult exploit of the solitary life in the prime of his youth. He left his parental home and settled in a desolate wilderness place far off from worldly enticements, and he spent his days in unceasing prayer After the death of his parents, the saint refused his inheritance and requested his kinsmen to give it away to the poor. By his strict ascetic life, fasting, and love for mankind, Abraham attracted to him many seeking after the spiritual light, prayer, and blessing. Soon his faith was put to a serious test. He was appointed presbyter in one of the pagan villages of Mesopotamia. For three years, and sparing no efforts, the monk toiled over the enlightenment of the pagans. He tore down a pagan temple and built up a temple of God. Humbly enduring derision and even beating from obstinate idol worshippers, in prayer he beseeched the Lord, Look down, O Master, upon thy servant. Hearken unto my prayer. Strengthen me and set free thy servants from diabolical snares and grant them to know thee, the one true God. The zealous pastor was granted the happiness to see the culmination of his righteous efforts. The pagans came to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the monk himself baptized them. Having fulfilled his priestly duty, Abraham again withdrew into his wilderness, where he continued to glorify God and doing his holy will. The devil, put to shame by the deeds of the monk, tried to entrap him with proud thoughts. One time at midnight, when Saint Abraham was at prayer in his cell, suddenly there shone a light and a voice was heard, Blessed art thou, blessed as is no one amongst mankind, Confuting the wiles of the enemy, the saint said, I am a sinful man, but I trust on the help and grace of my God, and fear thee not. Another time, the devil appeared before the saint in the form of a youth, lighted a candle, and began to sing the song. Blessed is the undefiled on the way that walketh in the law of the Lord. Perceiving that this also was a demonic temptation, the elder crossed himself and asked, If thou knowest, what be the undefiled blessed? Then why troublest thou them? 
the tempter answered, I provoke them in order to conquer them and turn them away from every good deed. To this the saint replied, Thou gainest victory over those fallen away from God through their will, but for those loving God thou dost vanish like smoke in the wind. After these words the devil vanished. And thus did Saint Abraham defeat the enemy, strengthened by divine grace. After fifty years of ascetic life, he peacefully expired to the Lord in the year 360. And from the Synaxarion, Saint Abramius and Mary, his niece. Saint Abramius, a master of temperance and spiritual exercises, left the large property he inherited to the poor and devoted himself entirely to the service of God and his neighbor. He lived in a deserted place where he prayed and studied the Holy Scriptures. From there he went to different cities to preach the Word of God and to minister the kingdom of truth and peace of the Gospel. His faith, love, and patience managed many times to soothe barbaric hearts and to attract excessively enraged souls to the cross. For over 70 years, Abramios maintained all the vitality of his apostolic activity. Protected even by his age, he was able to devote himself to the salvation of sinful men and women. Once he succeeded in pulling his brother's daughter, Maria, out of the thicket of sin. He saw her in an inn, without knowing her, laden with jewels and in the company of promiscuous youths. However, the misguided young woman had not completely discarded her pious memories. The next day, he went to the old ascetic and asked for his blessing. He answered her that the blessing of men is of no use, when God is forced to provide me with his own. These words shook Mary. She repented, confessed, and from then on she lived a holy life. And Abramios died a mighty man, faithfully serving God to the end. And more about St. Abraham's niece, the nun Maria. St. Abraham's niece, the nun Maria, grew up being edified by his spiritual instruction. But the enemy of the race of man tried to turn her from the true path. At 27 years of age, she left her cell, went to another city, and began to live dissolutely. Learning of this, the monk Abraham donned himself in soldier's garb so that he should not be recognized, and he set off to the city. He sought out his niece and brought her to repentance. The nun Maria returned to her cell and spent all the rest of her days in prayer and tears of repentance. The Lord vouchsafed her the gift of healing the sick. She died five years after the monk Abraham. A hymn of praise. The venerable Abramius the Recluse. Saint Abramius left his bride and dedicated his life to strict asceticism. By asceticism he worked out his salvation and wisely directed others to salvation. Demonic power attacked the saint, but in the name of Christ he crushed it. The demon took on various horrible guises to scare and hinder the man of God. This man of God did not allow himself to fear or separate his mind from God but shone on the world like a candle, glorifying the one God, the most holy trinity, imprisoned, alone and not wanted by the world. Abramius became a prisoner for the sake of Christ for fifty years, fifty years of tears, fasting, and struggle, all for the Son of God. For fifty years, fifty years, years established on Christ, the firm foundation. Glory to Abramius, Christ's soldier, that on the mortal earth he has shown us immortality. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved, says the Lord. Matthew 10, 22. 
Faith is the only light of endurance. For endurance in and of itself implies unbearable darkness. Faith is the shining star in this darkness. Faith eases the sharpness of suffering. It bears on its wings all the weight of endurance. Saint Abramius gives us a beautiful example of perseverance in endurance. The vexation that the devil caused him by a multitude of temptations and terrors would have driven lesser men to leave one place for another. But Abramius did not want to move, so as not to give the evil demon a cause to rejoice. He remained in his place and defeated the devil. The bishop of that region sent Abramius to a pagan village to convert the villagers to the Christian faith. After long hesitation, Abramius set out, saying, Let it be as God wills. I will go out of obedience. He first built a church in that village. Then he smashed all the idols in plain sight of the villagers. They beat him and whipped him half to death and drove him from their village. But he prayed to God with tears for them that the Lord would open the eyes of their hearts to know the truth of Christ. And so the pagans continually beat and abused him over the course of three years, but he constantly prayed to God for them and was not angered with them, enduring in the faith as a firm rock. And only after three years of labor, tears, forgiveness, and faith, he was rewarded. Suddenly, the consciences of the villagers were awakened, and they all came together to Abramius, bowing before him and receiving the Christian faith from him. Acts chapter 13 Antioch sends Barnabas and Saul. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Menaean was raised with Herod, Antipas, Tetrarch from 4 BC to AD 39 the son of the Herod who slaughtered the infants in Bethlehem in Matthew 2.16. Menaean was one of the early Christians with noble family connections. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away ministered, the Greek leitorgunton, literally means performed liturgical acts. It is the same root word from which liturgy is derived. This phrase would be more accurately translated as they performed the liturgy to the Lord and fasted. Liturgical worship did not originate in Antioch. Its roots are in ancient Israel. Saul and Barnabas, who came from Jerusalem, taught the Antiochian Christians, among other things, true worship. Note, too, that fasting and liturgy are inseparable. It is in the midst of this liturgy that the Holy Spirit speaks. Separate means to set apart for special service. And in verse 3, laid hands on them, is a reference to the sacrament of ordination. While contemporary Orthodox practice is usually to ordain no more than one person to a specific rank at a given liturgy, here was a case of multiple ordinations. Note that even Saul, Paul, who had a direct call to serve from Jesus Christ, still had to experience ordination in the church. churches established on Cyprus. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. 
And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. The synagogues were the initial places of Christian preaching. For Christianity arose from Judaism, and the Jews had been prepared through the Old Testament for the Christ. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elemus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O fool! of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. This is the first use in Acts of the name Paul for Saul. No particular significance is stated, but it was not the result of his conversion as many have suggested, for he is still called Saul for quite some time after his conversion. Paul is a Roman name and Saul is a Hebrew name. Many Jews of this time had two names, one Jewish and another Greek or Roman. Paul may have begun to favor his Roman name out of humility. Paul means little or because his ministry was now becoming more focused on the Gentiles. St. John Chrysostom suggests that the name change was the result of ordination, just as Christ gave Simon the new name Peter. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The hand of the Lord acts not to inflict punishment for punishment's sake, but to bring repentance and conversion, which proves fruitful in this case of the proconsul. This is the first recorded instance of conversion to Christ of a high Roman official. The Church in Pisidia Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Persia in Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. His departing from them became the cause of great strife with Paul and also between Paul and Barnabas, but God's work still flourishes. But when they departed from Persia, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Antioch and Pisidia was in Galatia and should not be confused with Antioch of Syria, from which Paul and Barnabas had just been sent. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, If you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up, and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. Paul preaches Christ based on his fulfillment of Old Testament events and prophecies. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. 
and afterward they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. The heart of Paul's message is, one, Christ is the promise and therefore the fulfillment of the Jewish faith. Two, Jesus is the seed of David and thus fulfills his office as the true king of Israel. And three, Jesus is the one John the Baptist preached. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. The family of Abraham refers to the Jews, while those who fear God refer to the Gentile believers. Thus, salvation is proclaimed to all mankind. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. Paul consistently presses the point that if the Old Testament is properly understood, it is clear Jesus is the Messiah. Even the Jewish leader's rejection of Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people, and we declare to you glad tidings that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us as their children, in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him up from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, Everyone who believes is justified from all the things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. In addition to Christ's death and resurrection, two recurring themes in apostolic preaching are, number one, the forgiveness of sins, and two, nobody is justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, and the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Apostles to the Gentiles On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and, contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. 
Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so, so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. Many of the Jews reject the teaching that salvation is for all people, so Paul and Barnabas now turn to the Gentiles. This pattern continues throughout Acts. The gospel is preached first to the Jews, God's chosen people, then to the Gentiles. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. A Contemplation on Acts chapter 13 Contemplate the terrible punishment by which Paul punished the magician. How a certain Jewish magician held Sergius the deputy under his dark power. How Paul, by a word, blinded that magician. And how the deputy saw that miracle, believed in Christ, and was baptized. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through 5 Models to imitate Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Note the progression. They first gave themselves to the Lord. They offered up themselves, John Chrysostom, and then to us, to the church, to the apostles. If our lives are an offering to God, they will be an offering to his people as well. St. John Chrysostom says of this verse, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. He mentions together two praises of the Macedonians, or rather three, namely that they bear trials nobly, that they know how to pity, and that, though poor, they had been displayed profuseness and almsgiving, for their property had also been plundered. He calls what they did grace, not merely in order to keep them humble, but both to provoke them to emulation and to prevent what he said from proving invidious. Now what he says is to this effect, their poverty not only was no impediment to their being bountiful, but was even an occasion to them of abounding, just as affliction was feeling of joy. The, for the poorer they, they were, the more munificent they were, and contributed the more readily. Therefore he also admires them exceedingly. What is gave themselves to the Lord? They offered up themselves. They showed themselves approved in faith. They displayed much fortitude in their readiness and zeal. What does and to us mean? They were tractable to the rain, 
loved and obeyed us, both fulfilling the laws of God and bound to us by love. They did not obey God in some things, and in some the world, but they obeyed Him in all things and gave themselves wholly to God. For they were not filled up with senseless pride because they showed mercy, but displaying much lowly-mindedness, much obedience, much reverence, much heavenly wisdom, they wrought their alms deeds in this way also. But what is by the will of God? They did this also according to the mind of God. St. John Chrysostom Luke chapter 8 verses 16 through 21 Take care how you hear. Also found in Mark chapter 4 verses 21 through 25. No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand, that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore take heed how you hear, for whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. Jesus' True Kinsman Then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some who said, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. In these verses, it was not Christ's will to deny his mother and brothers. Rather, Jesus is correcting both them and his hearers to the right idea concerning himself that the family of his kingdom is not nat by nature, but by virtue. St. John Chrysostom Nothing is secret that will not be revealed. He says, I have kindled the light. It is true, but it is continuing to burn. Let that come of your diligence, not for your own sakes alone, but also for the sake of those who are to profit by these rays and to be guided by the truth. Calumnies surely will not be able to obscure your brightness if you are quiet and living a strict life becoming to those who are to convert the whole world. Therefore, show forth a life worthy of His grace, so even as it is preached everywhere, this light may be everywhere accompany you. Next, He sets before them another sort of gain, besides the salvation of mankind enough to make them strive earnestly and to lead them to all diligence. You will not only amend the world, he says, if you live rightly, but you will also give occasion for God to be glorified and how it may be asked. Will God be glorified through us if at least men are to speak evil of us? Not all men and even those who do this in envy will in their conscience admire and approve you, just as the outward flatterers of such as live in wickedness do in mind accuse them. What then? Do you command us to live for display and vain glory? Far from it. Let your virtue be great, and the fire abundant, and the light unspeakable. For when virtue is so great, it cannot be hid even though its pursuer should shade it over ten thousandfold. Present to them an irrehensible life and let them have no true occasion of evil speaking. And then, though there be thousands of evil speakers, no man will be able to cast any shade upon you. And well, he did say, Your light, for nothing makes a man so illustrious, how manifold soever his will to be concealed, as the manifestation of virtue. For as if he were clad with the very sunbeam, so he shines, yet brighter than it, not spending his rays on earth, but also surmounting heaven itself. 
and he did not say, God, but your father, already sowing beforehand the seeds of that noble birth, which was about to be bestowed upon them. St. John Chrysostom A homily on the glory of the name of God, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Psalm 72, verse 19. From the grace-filled heart of the prophet flow words full of grace. The prophet speaks of the king and the king's son, the most unusual king who has ever appeared on earth. May his name be blessed forever, Psalm 72, 17. The prophet said, and then, as if that were not enough, he said it again and added his glorious name. The church of Christ is the glory of Christ. Blessed is his holy church, the fruit of his labors, the wreath of his humiliation, the work of his hands, and the flower of his blood. Blessed is the very name of his church, holy and salvific. And with his church, that is, with his work and with his glory, the whole earth shall be filled by the words forever and ever. The prophet foretold the immortal work of Christ, that is, his church. She will be built in time and will be revealed in eternity. She will be built until the end of time and will be revealed whole in eternity. O oh, my brethren, let us strive that our souls may be built into Christ's church, into that living and immortal body whose life has no end, and whose beauty is indescribable. Let us strive that we are not rejected as unsuitable and useless stones to be cast into the abyss of eternal darkness. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, King and Son of the King, Write us also in the book of immortality, and remember us in thy heavenly kingdom. To thee be glory and praise forever. Amen.